So tonight uh, we've got a, a real treat. Many of you, I'm sure, will be will know of uh, Sir Thomas Brown and uh, one of his books called Religio Medici, but I'm sure not too many, including myself, are not familiar with the um, topic of tonight's talk, which uh, is going to be delivered by our well-known academic colleague, Dr. Ross Grimmett. It's called The Vulgar Errors of Sir Thomas Brown in relation to the Pseudoxia Epidemica, and I'm sure Ross will tell us how he came to be interested in this uh, very interesting topic and uh, the, of, of the origin of, of his talk. So thank you very much indeed, Ross. Uh, thanks very much, Terry. And uh, I apologise at this stage for sitting, but my legs are starting to play up. And if I have problems with my voice, I've been coughing for three weeks. So just let me have a glass of water. So, uh, well, uh, those of you who've had a classical education, and by looking around here, I think all of you will have had a classical education. I don't see any, oh, just one non-pensioner across at the back there. Well, those of you who've had a classical education will have heard of Sir Thomas Brown as a man of letters in 17th century England. But that's not all he was. And 60 years ago, I was a callow second-year chemistry student at Otago, uh, sitting in a chemistry club lecture one Saturday morning, and Dr. Bill Edwards, the applied chemist, gave a talk on the chemistry of Sir Thomas Brown. And it was then that I realised this man was a bit more than I'd heard about at Otago Boys, because at least he was mentioned in the literature course at, at Otago Boys. Uh, they mentioned he wrote Religio Medici, but we never were shown any of it. We'd never read any of it. I just remembered the name. So uh, he was a man, well, let's just get this thing going. He had a, a deep curiosity about the natural world and he was influenced very much by the scientific revolution that had been brought into Britain uh, a bit before his time, only a couple of decades, by Sir Francis Bacon here. And uh, he modified it to some extent because he had a Christian faith which sort of impinged on his science a wee bit. And uh, he lived through, I guess, what we could call a fairly uncomfortable and often intolerant era. He was through the early Stuart kings and then there was the civil war and the Commonwealth under Cromwell and then the restoration of Charles II and uh, wedged in there was the gunpowder plot and the great plague and the fire of London. So a lot of things were going on at that stage. He was a, a great reader. He had a wonderful classical knowledge. Uh, he was fluent both reading and writing Latin and Greek. And he probably got by in Italian and French and Dutch and maybe German as well. Uh, but some of his contemporaries said he was prone to bouts of melancholia. So he probably had a little bit of depression uh, from time to time. But when you read his works, there's a fair amount of subtle humour that turns up. And one uh, particular time he was commenting on the inordinate time that some scholars took to get their work written up. And in particular, he pointed to Sir Francis Bacon as one of those, but also to the great Dutch uh, jurist and philosopher uh, Hugo Grotius. Uh, he also took an awful long time to publish his work. Brown put it down to the usual academic afflictions, too many commitments and hemorrhoids. <laughs> now Francis Bacon uh, had set out, as he said, to rescue learning from the misapprehensions and erasures that had arisen right back since the fall of man. He really was talking about since the time of the early Greek philosophers. A lot of information had got lost, the Alexandria Library fire, but all sorts of problems in the Mediterranean, uh, an awful lot of Greek and, and Latin text got lost. And in particular, many of them were rescued by the Arabs, but then they were translated into Arabic and nobody could read Arabic. So a lot of stuff was lost, there were a lot of mistakes. Well. Brown would gladly join that crusade of Bacon's and today we look on uh, Bacon as the originator of empiricism, the idea that true knowledge can only come from observation and experiment. And so you needed to use your senses, sight, smell and everything and do some experiments. And he 
brought in what we call the inductive methodologies of research. That is, you set out to do some experiments which will help support whatever theory or postulate you're trying to talk about at that stage. Bacon felt that using reason was a waste of time. Brown didn't think that. However, experiment was the be-all and end-all. Now, essentially, Bacon was talking about the scientific method we use today, although we're, we're encouraged to go further. We're encouraged to try and design some experiments which might disprove our theory. And if we can't disprove it, that's further evidence that we might be right, but we not be, might not be entirely right. Well, he was born in London in 1605. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm sure that's 1605, that picture. But he was born there, and he was the son of a, a silk merchant. Uh, but his father died when he was still a lad, and uh, they sent him off to Winchester College. And in 1623, off he went to Oxford, and three years later, he uh, came out of there with a BA. And then with £6,000 from his father's estate, he's supposed to have set up in medical practice in Oxfordshire. Now, I'm not quite sure how much medical education would have been in an Oxford BA in those years. So maybe it was a practical course that you learned on the job. Anyway, uh, after a, a few years, he took off on a grand tour of Europe. And rather than just being a tourist one, it was an educational one. He started off uh, studying at the University of Padua in, in Italy. That, of course, was where William Harvey had studied earlier. It was also where the great Vesalius was a professor in the 1540s or so. He then moved from there to Montpellier in France, another university which was renowned uh, for its anatomy and its surgery and finally moved to Leiden in Holland, again a, a university with a very good reputation in anatomy and surgery. And at the end of, I'm not sure, a couple of years, he graduated from there with an MD. There were some advantages in Leiden. Uh, evidently the course was shorter than some of the others, and so it was cheaper. But I don't think he was short of money. Uh, the silk merchant was quite a wealthy man. Well, finally, he arrived back in England and he settled down in Norwich in Norfolk, population at that time about 20,000, so it was a fairly substantial city. And he practiced medicine and he researched and he wrote for the next 45 years there. Now, Norwich at the time, in fact, for a long time, had always been a hotbed of anti-royalist sentiment. It was full of roundheads in, in the end, but Brown was always an ardent royalist himself. And as uh, Terry mentioned, uh, his first published work was Religio Medici, or The Religion of a Physician. It turned out to be pretty controversial. He had some ideas that really didn't meet with the, uh, or di the church didn't quite like them. So there was a certain amount of uh, deletion, the expurgation required. There were some changes to be made. Eventually it was published in 1645, but then, for a while, it was banned. Uh, it doesn't seem at all, I haven't read all of it, but it doesn't seem at all controversial nowadays. But in it, he, um, he wrote um, with lordly contempt of the institution of matrimony. He, and he expressed his regret that humans could not be propagated like tides rather than the vulgar and the trivial way of marriage. He, he then took a wife, and that showed that his beliefs didn't necessarily uh, match his desires. And the pair of them settled down to raise a family in Norwich, and a very busy practice. And the, he practiced out of this particular house here. Now, it was pulled down in Victorian times, and that drawing was done before it was pulled down. The only other thing I can find out about it was that he had to pay the city father six months a year to allow him to leave those big beams there because one of the walls was bulging and about to fall down. So we know that. That was roughly in the hay market. All the time that he could spare from his uh, doctoring, he spent researching, studying, reading, experimenting, and he brought together a very large group of uh, a large library. He bought a wonderful library. He had collections of antiquities, collections of all sorts of curiosities. 
And in 1646, he first published this book. Uh, it was a, an encyclopedic collection of bits and pieces. He called it Pseudodoxia Epidemica. Uh, the subtitle, the printers made a bit of a mistake. He put an, an N into tenets there, but uh, we won't worry about the subtitle. Now, essentially, the title refers to the prevalence of false opinions or beliefs. Pseudodoxia just means false opinions, and as Brown put it, vulgar errors. And vulgar had the 17th century meaning of common. So he was looking at common errors. And it's a very sceptical work, and it debunks a whole lot of legends and sayings that were around at the time. It shows the Baconian side of Brown, uh, the si side that was really trying to embrace which was still called the new learning at the time. And uh, I think it's significant, this book, in the history of science uh, and medicine, because it's promoting in places anyway an awareness of new up-to-date scientific thinking. And the experimentation associated with it, with it would have extended over his whole lifetime. There were a number of editions with the final one in 1672, so the last 10 years of his life he didn't publish anything. But he describes uh, how he traces these errors. Uh, it describes the experiments he carried out, uh, most of them in what we'd now say was a pretty acceptable scientific manner. And he had three determinants for obtaining the truth. First of all, he read what the past authors had said. Then he started to think about whether they could be right or not. But then the final one, and this was the one that Bacon really liked, he had to get some empirical evidence. He had to make observations. He had to do some experimentation to test them out. And he applied each of these determinants to everything from cosmology to metallurgy to geology to natural history to uh, common folklore and the Bible, essentially. And the first edition came out uh, just as the English Civil War was going, so it probably didn't help sales too much at that stage. But in the introduction he wrote, We are often constrained to stand alone against the strength of opinion and meet the giant and Goliath of authority with contemptible pebbles and feeble arguments drawn from the scrip and slender stock of ourselves. Wish I'd said that. <laughs> In a lovely way with words. And the vulgar errors were perpetuated, according to Brown, for three main reasons. First of all, man's fallible. People make mistakes. Secondly, nearly everyone was illiterate anyway and they would believe anything that someone tells them is written down. And the third one, which was his pet hate, obstinate adherence unto the authorities of the past. And he said, People believe that horses and cows do not cough, belch, or otherwise break wind because Aristotle, Aristotle and other sages said they don't. <laughs> and he said, Yet you only have to venture into the countryside to find that the opposite is true. He criticises his fellow physicians, uh, those who still believe that absolutely every bodily problem could be diagnosed by examining urine. And certainly there are quite a few that can be diagnosed that way, but not all of them. The problem was that his religion did impinge on his science. And he believed that many of the vulgar errors were really the fault of Satan. And so maybe it was a, a strongly held Christian belief, but you can never be quite sure. It was a very intolerant era, and you had to be very careful what you wrote down. He may just have written that he thought it was Satan's fault, but we'll take him at his word and say that it didn't, because I think religion was quite an important thing in his life. It was a time, of course, when heresy uh, wasn't unheard of. And, and when you read Religio Medici, and I, I've only delved into bits. It's obvious for all the scientific thought processes he believed in the existence of both angels and witches. He thought that witches were just one aspect of the powers of the devil and uh, like most of his contemporaries he believed in them and so he's just I guess a victim of his own times in what we'd now call a vulgar superstition. But he um, we know he attended the Bury St Edmunds witch trials, the 1662 lot, and he gave evidence there uh, 
really against a couple of unfortunate women who were accused and helped make sure that, that they were, were hanged. I haven't got one of only two witches hanging, sorry. But, um, so he really was prepared to believe that these women had been witches. But he's quite contradictory in his views on magic. He, um, at times he espouses it, other times he attacks it, he rationalises it, but he tries to use science all the time to do it if he can. And we need to remember that at his time medicine was largely empirical. You tended to use cures that had been handed down uh, and maybe they worked or maybe they didn't, but if they worked you didn't necessarily know why they worked. And if you didn't know why they worked, might it not be magic that causes it? Why does such a poison work? We don't know why it works. Maybe there's some magic or something supernatural associated with it. So he was prepared to try these uh, so-called occult remedies uh, because some of them had been shown to work. Uh, he said he preferred to use reasoned ones first if he could. But he has mentioned one or two fairly ridiculous remedies that were handed down from the past. And uh, he wrote that authority states that a, a sure antidote against the, the scorpion sting is to sit on thy ass with thy face towards its tail, for so the pain passeth from the man into the beast. Now he doesn't test this one, but I guess you couldn't get scorpions in, in England at the time. There's another one that he mentioned at the same time, an occult potion, which involved the left stone of a weasel wrapped in the skin of a she-ass. It's the left testicle of a weasel wrapped in the skin of a she-ass, and that ensured that a maid will not conceive. <laughs> now I can see one or two modern pharmaceutical companies who are making millions out of selling oral contraceptives getting a little worried here, because here surely is a natural organic prophylactic. <laughs> And so there will be worries, and I think there might be one or two male weasels with worries as well. <laughs> well, let's uh, go on to a bit more serious stuff. And he, uh, he was prepared to um, do experiments, to make observations uh, on what he called vulgar errors and beliefs that had been handed down from the past. And so he looked at objects which had, were supposed to have specific um, magical and curative properties. And for example, there are still some people who believe in unicorns, and for centuries they were believed to have magical properties. And so wealthy, powerful people all wanted to have a unicorn's horn, which would guarantee they wouldn't get poisoned. So when they sat down for their glass of red at night, they would stir the red with the unicorn's horn and know that nobody had poisoned them. Well, Brown was able to examine some of these unicorn horns, and they'd obviously been sold by uh, second-hand unicorn horn dealers uh, for an immense amount of money to people. And he, he, there were some in cabinets of curiosity among his uh, wealthier friends, and he came up with most of them being narwhal or sea unicorn horns, but he also found others that had been fashioned from elephant tusks and from rhinoceros horns. And uh, he also made an observation, he'd looked at pictures of the unicorn that had been handed down over the centuries, and prints probably started to be made about the 15th, 14th, 15th century, but he thought, well, the unicorn would have found it great difficulty in being a herbivore, because every time it put its head down to get some grass, that horn would stick into the ground, so it could only eat tall grass. According to Brown. Now, the we carry on with poison. There have always been tales of poisoners using powdered glass, uh, but it never would have worked very well. I mean, uh, to get someone to swallow it for a start, you'd have to make it very finely powdered, and then if they managed to get it down, it might cause a bit of irritation of the digestive tract, perhaps some, some bleeding, and it might stir up your hemorrhoids on the way out, but it's not likely to poison you. But the problem was that Pliny the Elder, in his uh, natural history, had said that glass is poisonous. Now we know it's sodium silicate, calcium silicate, not inherently poisonous at all. And so Brown really had to test this. He wanted to make sure this 
was a vulgar error. He made some glass, uh, powdered glass up into a paste and fed it to his wife's lap dog and the dog survived and I don't think he told his wife about it. But uh, so he, he uh, realised then that, that the glass was not poisonous. Uh, interesting to see Pliny's date, 79 AD, he died of Vesuvius, the time of Pompeii and Herculaneum being destroyed. But Pliny had also written that diamonds are made soft or broken when goat's blood is poured on them. Now Brown initially went off and spoke to some lapidaries, some gem cutters, and they said that's a load of rubbish, uh, but he needed to test it. So he took a diamond, put it on an anvil, poured some goat's blood on it, and smote it many times with a hammer, whereupon he said the hammer broke. So Pliny may have been mistranslated that maybe goat's blood softens hammers, but <laughs> never quite. But, but when he read further through it, the, it, it appears that the goat had first to be fed wine which had uh, a number of herbs steep, uh, put into it. And among those was silver montanum, which is a clover-like perennial that Aristotle had mentioned. Uh, there was also something called petrosolinum, which uh, appears to be a bit like parsley, and one or two other herbs. But all of them were herbs that were reputed to break or soften bladder stones. So they must have been used as medications. Well... In his own practice, Brown preferred to treat bladder stones with an infusion of the second distillation of urine injected directly into the bladder, or if he could get it, a decoction of crab's eyes, which was probably more expensive. Uh, he was qualified to do lithotomy, cutting for the stone, but he felt it was very dangerous and it also made the patient's eyes water, to say the least. <laughs> Uh, it was evidently, evidently practised by itinerant swine gelders at the time who would do it more cheaply than, than surgeons would. And some of you will have read Samuel Pepys' feelings on being cut for the stone. A wee bit of chemistry. Now in Brown's time, the burning process was not understood. It was too early for him to know about Becker and Stahl's experiments well, Becker and Stahl's idea uh, about phlogiston theory. And they thought they had discovered a new element, they called it phlogiston or fire stuff, and it was present in everything that was going to burn. And when it burned, the phlogiston escaped. Well, had Becker and Stahl bothered to weigh the ashes, they'd have found that the ashes weighed more than the original wood, which meant that phlogiston would have to have a negative weight. Uh, their work was pretty late in Brown's life. He may or may not have heard about it. He was probably better not to. But he did a number of experiments on combustion and he uh, looked at the observation that if you light a candle in a very small and closed space, it soon goes out. And we know because it, it burns up all the oxygen. Uh, Brown didn't know that. Oxygen wasn't discovered for at least another century. And his explanation, I think, was quite ingenious. He said it goes out because the fuliginous exhalations, that sooty smoke, the fuliginous, fuliginous exhalations wanting evaporation recoil upon the flame and choke it. It's quite a nice way of putting it. And he looked upon burning as the effect of some sort of effluvium. Now, effluvium was an old Greek idea and it was believed to flow off all things as films or uh, emanations, which roughly kept the shape of the original objects. It was a the sort of theory you could use to explain the ethereal nature of ghosts, ghosts perhaps the effluvium of dead, effluvia of dead people. But it originated with those Greek atomists who came up with a great idea that everything on Earth was a whole lot of different sorts of atoms flying around in a void. Now Robert Boyle was a contemporary of Brown and he thought he'd demonstrated the presence of effluvium when he evaporated water and then condensed it again. Well, he wasn't, wasn't right though. And so Thomas believed that, the, uh, that comets were the effluvia of stars. So they used this effluvium theory to, uh, it, it was generally accepted, they used it to explain why some poisons or, or medication work. For example, Gold was thought to be a, a cordial medicine, 
Brown swallowed a pellet of gold and said he felt better, but it weighed the same before and after. Uh, therefore, it must have been the effluvium of the gold that was doing him good. So everything was attributed to effluvium, or they were starting to think about miasma, particularly for the spread of disease. So the, the miasma, the bad air that was coming out of uh, marshes and stagnant pools, blamed for diseases like cholera, uh, bubonic plague, and malaria, and I'll talk a wee bit more about malaria shortly. Well now for a bit of non-PC stuff. Uh, the nature of colour was not known, really not understood in the 17th century. Scientists thought that colour was caused by a mixture of uh, salt, sulphur and mercury, with sulphur being the most important ingredient. But black skin in people was thought either to have been caused by the scorch of the sun or by the curses of God and Noah on Cham and his descendants. Now Cham, remember, or Ham, was Noah's naughty son and he was the one that exposed the poor old fellow's wrinkly body to ridicule after he became roaring drunk in his tent. And he was then cursed, uh, cursed really, uh, forever after and all his descendants to be black. Now Brown checked up on all the biblical sources and it turned out that all Cham's descendants were wound up in Canaan so they weren't black at all. And so either uh, the Bible was mistranslated at some stage or this wasn't true. And he was then faced with the problem, well, maybe it was the scorch of the sun that caused it. So he started off by asking himself a series of questions that might work this out. And why does the sun make men black when fire does not? Well, the sun does make men darker in colour. Uh, we know nowadays that's because the stimulation of melanin pigments, which act as photoprotectants. Brown, of course, wouldn't know that. But the other two ones, why do Negroes transplanted into cold climes not change colour and so on? Why do white people sent off to the tropics not turn black? The second one's an interesting question because it really nowadays um, fits in quite nicely with the out of Africa theory that we originally started off dark coloured and as we migrated north to places where there was less sunlight we had to evolve so that we could actually get more vitamin D and so on. Now whether and Brown would not have known that at all. Uh, and so it was a very difficult one to explain to his own satisfaction. He was really left just with the questions. He tried to think that it might be a seminal reason, but then he got sidetracked into looking at the sperm of black and white men and found it was the same colour. But of course, Aristotle had found that in 350 uh, BC. He tried that out as well. The, um, so it was a problem. But we can see that Brown is thinking about colour very, very much indeed. You find him agonising in Pseudodoxia over why is grass green? Why are the roots white? How can a plant with green leaves and white roots bring forth flowers of many colours? But he could never know about it at that stage. And in fact, it was not till 1672, and that was the date of the last edition of Pseudodoxia, that Newton finally got round to writing up his his theories on the uh, or separation of light with a prism into the uh, spectrum uh, with the violet at the short wavelength end and red at the long wavelength end. And subsequent to that, of course, we know that the green colour in grass is caused by molecules like chlorophyll that can absorb the white light, but not all of it, and they reflect the green wavelengths. I think that Brown did not badly with the knowledge that was available to him at the time. But he pondered on a lot of biblical matters, everything from whether Adam and Eve should have had navels or not, and did Adam have one fewer rib than Eve did, what was the nature of the fruit, and did the serpent originally have limbs? A rather effeminate looking surgeon, uh, one there from a Dutch artist. But of course uh, Genesis 3.14 uh, God cursed the serpent and said, On your belly you shall go and eat dust all the days of your lives. 
So here's evidence anyway that the serpent originally did have limbs. But Brown was a player prepared to apply reason to parts of the Old Testament. I've just put the wrong page down, haven't I? Now, he, many of his interests, as, uh, interests were associated natural, with natural history and medicine and what he could find in the countryside around him. He was a very keen collector and observer of all the animals and plants in the countryside. Uh, he brought together a a great collection. He's said to have had the best collection of birds' eggs in Britain, for example. But his house was absolutely stuffed full with all sorts of antiquities and curiosities uh, and less savoury items, as we'll see. But of course, from Renaissance times, we know that uh, wealthy men like to put together a, a cabinet of curiosity to show off to their friends. So no wonder Brown wanted one too. I'm not sure his wife wanted it as much as he did. But he was a Renaissance man and his interest in chemistry and mineralogy and all the other topics were of significance. Largely, when they were able to throw some light on medical or biological matters around him. So as we might expect he was especially harsh on vulgar errors pertaining to natural history because there it was easiest for him to observe and to, to uh, experiment. Now there was an old saying, it came from the first century AD, that mandrake appears human and naturally grows under gallows, feeding on the blood and urine and fat that drops from the bodies of the hanged felons. Brought forth a cutting retort from Brown. This is like making putrefactive generations correspondent to seminal productions, which almost is poo-pooing one aspect of Aristotle's spontaneous generation theory, the idea that life can actually come out of something inanimate, like frogs from the mud of the Nile and so on. Get somebody to give a talk on spontaneous generation theory. It's something that would make an interesting topic. But Mandrake was believed to have uh, magical properties and nowadays we know the roots contain a variety of alkaloids. Uh, there are atropine, scopolamine, hyoscyamine, so you've got anticholinergics, hypnotics, uh, hallucinogens. Uh, people used to rub the powdered plant to help rheumatism on them. They took it internally for everything from melancholia to mania. There's a fairly good chance that it might have given them melancholia <laughs> and mania with the constituents in it. But the mandrake wholesalers weren't above carving the roots into human form to make them sell more readily. And they put about the tale that when you pull the mandrake plant out of the ground, it emits an absolutely unearthly shriek, which is instantly fatal to anyone that hears it. Well, that put off any other would-be gatherers. And these um, purveyors of mandrake used to have specially trained dogs they would tie them to the plants and they would get out of earshot and whistle for the dog and the dog would pull the plant out and bring it to them. Well, Brown didn't believe in the unearthly shriek that, and he said parsnips also shriek when you pull them out of the ground. <coughs> mm -hmm. Oh, so that helped the mandrake. <laughs> oh, what a lovely thought. <laughs> we should bring back hamming, hanging <laughs> mandrake gatherers. Now, he was sceptical of a lot of the medical claims for minerals and things like minerals. And uh, just a brief word about bezoars. Um, they include a whole lot of stone-like masses. Some of them are actually matted here. But stone-like masses you find in the intestines of animals and humans and included with bezoars are uh, gallstones. And they were believed to have particular magical qualities and that they were antidotes against poison. So if you got poisoned and you managed to get a bezoar down, uh, you could actually recover from it. Didn't actually help a French cook who'd been caught stealing the royal silver. Uh, he was uh, sentenced to death and he said, well, look, why don't I take poison and you can test a bezoar on me? But it didn't work. Anyway, since this time, scientists have discovered that some forms of bezoar can actually absorb arsenates and arsenites. 
So hang on to your gallstones just in case. <laughs> a wee bit more natural history from here. That an elephant hath no joints. Now, the 5th century Greek physician, uh, Theseus the Nidian, uh, supposedly from personal observation, gave a, a description of the elephant which Brown recounted. As it hath no joints, it is unable to lie down, and hence it sleepeth standing upright, often leaning against a tree. Hunters capture them by sawing down the tree, whereupon the elephant falls and cannot rise again, as it has no joints. Well, Sir Thomas, of course, was late enough to be able to view an elephant skeleton. There was one in England, and he'd also seen a circus elephant, Neil. And besides that, he said, if it didn't have any joints, it wouldn't, in fact, be able to walk at all. But nowadays, we do know that elephants often do sleep standing up and also leaning against a tree. So poor old Theseus the Nidian, I think, can be forgiven for being misled in his description. This is one that probably most of you have heard of, that both Aesop and Pliny had written that when it's trying to escape from the hunter, a beaver bites off its own testicles and throws them towards the hunter because it knows that's what the hunters are after, and besides, you can now run faster. Uh, the beaver hunters were after the castorium or castoreum uh, found in the nether regions, and the beavers use it to mark territory, but it was uh, very valuable uh, for use in perfumery. And in the past, it was also used to treat headaches and fevers and hysteria. Well, beavers had become extinct in England, I think probably a century and a half before Brown was born. Somehow or other, he was able to examine a couple of male beavers, maybe Northern European or American. He concluded they were so constructed as to be physically incapable of getting their mouths in position to achieve the reported self-emasculation. He wrote, the testicles are seated inwardly along the loins, making it an impossible act for the beaver to castrate itself. And he added, and might be an hazardous action of art if attempted by others. <laughs> I think he might have meant humans there, but again, it would be an eye-watering possibility. In 1671, King Charles II and his court visited Norwich. And the courtier John Evelyn, who'd often corresponded with Brown, made good use of the royal visit to visit the learned doctor. And he wrote of his visit, His whole house and garden is a paradise and cabinet of rarities, and that of the best collection amongst medals, books, plants and natural things. And in fact, he must have enthused about it because King Charles then went and had a look at Brown's house at that stage. And at a banquet held in the Civic Hall a couple of days later, the, the king was obliged to honour a particular notable. The mayor was called forth, but he refused to come forth. And I think the mayor had probably been a roundhead. And so Brown was pushed forward and he was knighted and he was thereafter Sir Thomas Brown. Early writers had affirmed that uh, men being drowned and sunk do float on the ninth day when their gall breaketh. Well, Brown thought it questionable, and he thought that the time of floating was more likely to depend on the time of putrefaction, and that would depend on the subject and on the season. So he didn't have any human volunteers, so he did some experiments with mice, and he found that the fat ones rose soonest as he pointed out, because their bodies soonest ferment. And he also talked about the fact that uh, good eggs sink in water, addled ones rise, because he said of putrefaction, because we know it's, it's light gases which are forming there that decrease the density, things like hydrogen sulfide. But he also was careful enough to carry out experiments to ensure that it wasn't the gall breaking that caused the problem. So he dissected his mice and found the galls intact. Couldn't try out his theories on humans, as I said, as the casual opportunity were too rare to take any. Well, I think his long-suffering wife must have been at her wit's end with all the animals that were dismembered and so on throughout the house, uh, 
and I think the animal rights lobby in Norwich probably wasn't very uh, active in those days. Another one on the same one, that women being drowned float prone or men float supine. So women face down, men on their backs. Now Pliny had thought that freshly drowned women would float on their fronts because of the modesty of nature. Uh, Brown didn't believe it, but again he couldn't get any experimental material. Uh, but he tended to believe that men with great bellies would float face downwards. But women, and I use his words, not mine, women who are composed largely behind will float face upward. <laughs> not very PC, is he? But this is one, I um, hope anyone doesn't, movement doesn't cause them, that men weigh heavier dead than alive. Now that was, it had come down again from antiquity, it was fast losing favour, but there were still people who believed it. And uh, he quoted one of his contemporaries, still quite happy to believe it, that contemporary wrote, Why doth a man fall down in his sleep, who stood upright when awake, if he be not heavier than he was? Think about it. The old law of conservation of matter wasn't applying there. Well, Brown was remarkably restrained, I think, when he refuted this. He said, if experiment hath not failed us, this we cannot grant. So he went on to strangle a number of chickens on the kitchen scales and weighed them before and after, and I'm not quite sure how accurate his balance was, uh, but he found that their, their weights were absolutely the same. Well, as I've said before, he was very widely read in the number of languages, and particularly Latin and Greek. He always commented on his sources, and uh, he would, particularly when they were promoting cures or for particular illnesses. And you'll recall that he was prepared to use what he called magical cures or occult cures when the reasoned ones failed. Here's another one of those occult cures. Now aversion to water is uh, an early symptom of rabies and evidently the throat spasms are, are terrible. I don't know if anyone's seen anyone with rabies. But uh, if you try to drink water, it's like being drowned, I expect. So, uh, but there are other conditions that make uh, drinking water difficult. And uh, he described one case he'd observed. A young woman, 20 years old, labouring under the symptoms of hydrophobia, was plunged into a tub of water with a bushel of salt in it and was harassed by repeated dippings till she became insensible and on the point of death when she was left in the tub. In this state she was fortunate enough to recover her senses. Much to her own astonishment as well as that of the bystanders, she found herself capable of looking at water and even drinking it without choking. So some sort of aversion therapy going on there. I thought I'd come back to, ju to jaundice and, and uh, malaria. Now, malaria was still endemic in England in Brown's time, especially around the coastal marshes. They called it ague, they called it uh, tertian or quartan fever. I think the tertian one, you've got a fever every couple of days and the quartan one every, every third day. And one of the effects is jaundice, which is fairly easy to identify. Now, none of the treatments were particularly effective at all until uh, Jesuit powder or the powdered chinchona bark got there from the Americas. It was introduced about 1660. Uh, but of course it didn't catch on. The 1660s people were a bit more worried about the plague than they were about getting malaria at that stage. And I don't think it was used to any extent, perhaps even till 1680s or so. Anyway, before it came, there were magical cures and Brown tried them. Here's one of them. Burn wood under a leaden vessel filled with water. Take the ashes of that wood and boil it with the patient's urine. Then lay nine long heaps of the boiled ashes in ranks, and upon every heap lay nine spears of crocus. It hath greater effects than is credible to anyone who shall barely read this recipe without experiencing. It was a very long-winded procedure when you think about it, so maybe if they only had the tertian fever they might have recovered from that bout by the time he'd finished doing it. But then if that didn't work and perish the thought, the green ends of goose dung steeped in beer and strained and sweetened will surely do the trick. 
if you can manage to get it down. And of course, a lot of medical treatment at the time was based on the writings of the ancients and particularly uh, Dioscorides and his De Materia Medica, I think about a five volume tome there, largely herbal, but there was other stuff in it at all because he was a, a physician, he was a pharmacologist, he was a botanist. And uh, De Materia Medica would have been widely used by people that could afford to own one. Now in Brown's time, people roughly knew what the heart looked like, but many still believed it lay on the left hand side despite the fact that the dissection shows it's roughly in the middle. But Brown attributed the error to the fact that the heart beats easier to hear on the left because the big left ventricles pumping away there. But um, Harvey of course had published his book on the circulation of the blood, that was 1628. Brown would have been well aware of that. And I need really just to hark back to Terry Doyle's uh, Ibn al Nafis, the Arab physician, who showed at least the pulmonary circulation of the blood uh, back in the 13th century because nobody could read Arabic, so they didn't know about it. But, um, and in fact, in the next century, there's a, people hadn't all read the literature, there's a Hebrew, a Hebrew medical treatise which compared human anatomy to the architecture of a house. And I think it's quite sensible to consign the bowels to the basement anyway. But harking back to the heart on the left, uh, Brown then looked at the biblical words in Ecclesiastes, chapter 10, verse 2, which said, the heart of a wise man is on the right, but that of a fool is on the left. And he felt this was mere symbolic language, as we would now know. So associates right with good or wisdom, and the left with foolish or evil. Well, he loved experiment. And you can imagine his delight when a rotting 60-foot sperm whale was washed up on the beach near his home in Norfolk. It was a treasure trove for the delving doctor. And his experimental notes contain some of the following passages. Out of the head of the whale, having been dead divers days and under putrefaction, flowed streams of oil and spermaceti, which were carefully taken up and preserved by the coasters. The spermaceti was flammable. Not only the head, but the carnist parts contained it, for on roasting the oil dropped out. Now, spermaceti is a waxy material. It's found in the head cavity, and it was burned for heat and light. It's a wonderful white waxy material, and spermaceti candles burn with a clear light, no smell, not like the horrible smelly tallow ones that people would have had to put up with. Uh, he's he that goes on writing, the spermaceti flameth white and candent like camphor, uh, but dissolveth not an aqua fortis. Doesn't dissolve in nitric acid. Not quite sure why he tried that. But he said the oil differs from the oil of other animals. It very much frustrated the expectations of our soap boilers not incorporating with their lies. So it wouldn't uh, break down and form soap with their potash. Uh, and of course, we now know that, that whale oil is a mixture of long tain waxy esters. It's not a triglyceride like animal fats, and you don't get a typical soap when you boil it up with caustic. He said the country folk make use of it anyway for cuts and aches and tumours, and goes on. Had the abominable scent permitted, inquiry had been made of the strange composure of the head. In vain it was to rake the paunch of this leviathan for ambergris, insufferable fetter, denying that inquiry. But he continued, But if Paracelsus encourageth that ordure maketh the best musk, and from the most fetid substances may be drawn the most odiferous essences, all that had not Vespasian's nose might boldly swear that here was a subject fit for such extractions. So he's saying in beautiful prose, this was a pretty smelly whale. <laughs> now, the ref reference to Vespasian, who was a Roman emperor about three years after Nero, uh, was written, he was wrongly credited with setting up the urinals in France and the colonies that came to be called the Vespasian. Uh, from what I gather, it was that he uh, 
his tie-up with urine was that he taxed urine, which was used in the dye industry, and so he was making money from smell, <laughs> as it happened. Well, like many people of his era, when a short life was normal, Brown was fascinated by death. Happy to examine and delve into corpses whenever he could get them, waxes lyrical about fresh decayed bodies. They were heaven-sent experimental material. Tells of his delight in being able to examine the teeth of Egyptian mummies. And as for the moss on corpses, my goodness, the best I have seen was upon a woman's skull taken and laid in a room after 25 years' burial. I'm not quite sure what all this digging up was, how he was getting away with it at the time. We believe that he was the discoverer of adipocere, a greyish fatty mass that forms on buried corpses, called corpse wax or grave wax or mortuary wax, and it's formed by the bacterial hydrolysis of body fat, and it forms a mixture of long chain fatty acids and hydroxy acids. And it's such a hard mixture, it forms a permanent cast of parts of the body, so, so hard you can pick up old bodily injuries at a time. Anyway, um, he wrote up it up in, uh, in his discourse called Hydriotaphia, or Urn Burial. And he wrote, it came out in 1658, in a hydropical body, he means a dropsical body, ten years buried in a churchyard, we met with a fat concretion, where the nitre of the earth and the salt and the lixivious liquor of the body had coagulated large lumps of fat into the consistence of hardest Castile soap, whereof part remaineth with us. That means he grabbed the chunk and put it in his cabinet of curiosities. Now the lixivious uh, liquor of the body he's talking about is something that resembles caustic potash. So I think we, we need to um, forgive him for his description of the chemistry, which is clearly completely ridiculous, but he couldn't possibly know. Uh, he had a very lengthy discourse on subjects for observations in anatomy, and he discussed the advantages and disadvantages from the point of view of the dissector of various types of execution. And of course, most bodies for dissection would have come from malefactors uh, who in England at that time mostly would have been hanged. And though this left most parts of the body, as Brown put, discoverable, uh, there was considerable impediment to the areas around the throat. So Brown wanted to avoid this inconvenience, and he was trying to suggest to the authorities they might consider drowning instead of hanging, although he said it, it would actually probably distend the innards somewhat. He said another alternative was to use what they did in Pisa and poison people, but they'd have to be careful not to use corrosive poisons. Well, I think it's fairly obvious that the um, authorities never even noticed his suggestions there. And besides, the church was not at all happy about dissection of human bodies. Now, the uh, picture on the bottom right there is there of Vesalius, and uh, he was the father of human anatomy. He was professor of anatomy at uh, Padua University in the 1540s, and remember that's where William Harvey and Brown also studied. And the prints meant to show Vesalius doing a public anatomy. And they were pretty spontaneous events. They got a, someone pulled from the gallows, as long as the weather wasn't too hot. There was a hastily erected stage, enough room for the dissector and the body and as many spectators as to crowd on. They didn't advertise it. Uh, everyone that obviously heard about it, but of course the church did not want it going on. But of course it was necessary for the medical studies, for people to learn things. And uh, everything was then quickly dismantled afterwards. Well, Sir Thomas Brown died on the 19th of October 1682. It was his 77th birthday. And his amazing library was left to his eldest son, Edward, who was also a physician. And he also left his collection to Edward. But when he died in 1708, they, everything was sold at auction a couple of years later. And attending that auction was an Irish physician called Hans Sloane. 
and Hans Sloan, the man Sloan Square is named after in London. Uh, he was well, gave his collection, uh, which really formed the start of the British Museum. So some of Brown's stuff got into the British Museum, and some of his library was part of the founding of the British Library as well. Well, he had an impact on the English language. His works show the first recorded use of quite a lot of terms, many of which are scientific there. Works like, words like medical, computer. By computer, he meant someone that could do arithmetic. But words like uh, retrogression and so forth all first appeared in Brown. We think he probably coined them. His knowledge of Greek and Latin would allow him to do that easily. The last two, for vaginus and digladiation, have not stood the test of time. Uh, for vaginus means honeycombed, and digladiation it means sword fighting. Well, in conclusion, how do we assess the science and the medicine? And this has been a, a very hurried, pulled a few bits out of, of, of the book. I and mean, it's pretty hard to gauge his effect on the people of his own time. He lived in a fairly isolated part of England. It was a long way to London from Norwich in those days. He certainly corresponded with Evelyn that we know of. He corresponded with John Aubrey, sent him a CV for his brief lives. He wasn't a member of the Royal Society, but then it was only founded in 1660, and it really must have stuttered in that first 10 years with the plague and the fire and everything going on. But what we can say is that he had a, a critical mind. It's obvious when you read him. Uh, he was ready to believe mainly in the evidence of his own eyes and his other senses, and that stands as an example to us today. And his twin guiding principles were experience, experiment, observation, and reason. And they fit pretty well with what we understand by scientific endeavour, scientific method today. He never went quite as far as Bacon, who shouted from the rooftops that... Um, experience is liberating and reason is sterilizing. Uh, he used reason and he used experiment to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, he, never, uh, he never guaranteed, as had Descartes, that reason is inherently true. He believed you can be fooled by your senses. Reason depends very much on what your background knowledge is, for a starter. So experiment, observation and reason used to a greater or lesser extent. His big problem was that he was still fascinated by mystic symbols and analogies. Remember, he believed in the devil and he believed in witches. He accepted some magic and occult treatments. And he might have had some suspect views on the Old Testament, but they weren't terribly suspect. Uh, but all of those sorts of traits could cloud a strictly scientific approach to a problem. And I think I'd like to finish just with uh, words from one later commentator. Uh, he compared Brown's relationship with scientific inquiry to an instance of scientific reason lit up by the mysticism of the Church of England. Oh, thank you. I hope I... Cripes. I haven't gone too much over time. Yeah.